welcome to the Independent Artist Podcast, sponsored by the National Association of Independent Artists. Also sponsored by Zapplication. I'm Will Armstrong, and I'm a mixed media artist. I'm Douglas Sigworth, glassblower. Join our conversations with professional working artists. Douglas Sigworth, I'm back and ready for the podcast. Are you ready for more nauseating banter? Oh, nauseating, nauseating banter. <laughs> Jesus. I need to turn the stomachs of all of our fellow artists here on the podcast. Okay, come on. Give a little background as to why you're saying well, our conversation is nauseating while you're at it. We've been doing this a while now. A while, and, yeah. Mm-hmm. And I feel pretty, pretty good about the fact that this is our first bad review. Yeah. We got our first bad review. and, and Not even especially... a review. It's like a letter to the editor, like, I want to speak to your manager. <laughs> they got their full Karen on. Um, I, I've been told that that is, uh, that I shouldn't talk about Karens. That's one way that the world silences the voice of women. So I've been listening to that. And, okay. But, um, this woman was a total Karen. Well, you were a little crude. I think I even called you out on that one. I was nauseating. Nauseating Let's continue, and crude. Shall we? Yes. I have no plans to change my ways, my my wicked ways. Here's the thing. This is a volunteer project that you and I are just like kind of having fun with. And if somebody isn't enjoying us, I mean, uh, that you know, I'm sorry. <laughs> right. Uh, like George Carlin said, it's like the radio has two knobs. And I can understand her being uncomfortable with something with the knobs. But uh, uh, let's move on, shall we? We shall move on. So we are back from the last show. It was good seeing you out there. Mm hmm. I really appreciate you coming down the hill and seeing some of the new work. That meant a lot. I know it wasn't super easy on your your poor club feet. You know, coming to see you was not the problem. It was the going back up. (laughs) Oh, God. You needed a lift. I swear, they had a lift going the other direction. I was like, man, if if they only had that. (laughs) No, but it was fun. I I really enjoyed seeing that huge piece that you made last week. It's awesome. It is totally awesome. You know, I did not sell it there. Talking Mm -hmm. about new work, I did this one giant nine-foot by six foot painting i did not sell it at the last show and it's it's too heavy to take it was kind of a gamble you know this whole business is a gamble it is it didn't sell at that one i'm like i don't know and like i had to take a trailer in order to move it and all the stuff so i'm not discouraged but i don't know if i'm taking it everywhere until i get a new vehicle i no, so. i totally hear you on that because we have a pretty huge and involved glass sculpture piece that we do select which shows it's going to until, you know, kind of picking the market for one, but also picking the logistics is another part of it too. And it'll make a big, uh, nice backdrop for my huge wall in my studio down in Santa Fe. So it was almost like my Gruss Jafenko piece because I had, um, I had people stand in front of it all weekend and take pictures. So that was really cool. I uh, got a lot of a lot of hits on Instagram with that and mm-hmm. uh, a lot of people tagging me. So that was fun. And definitely some different kinds of conversations, okay. different designers and things like that. So it opens the door. Anytime you do something new, it's fun to it's fun to talk about it. But I don't know if you're like me. I don't quite I feel like I don't know how to talk about certain things yet. I don't have my spiel yet. Yeah, there is a little bit of finding your legs. I mean, yeah. definitely. Yeah. I don't know, Douglas. I feel like when you get new work. Sometimes you have the dialogue and you're really excited to to talk about it, but then you just start kind of tripping over your own words because you've never spoken about this story or this influence or where this is coming from or going. So it's 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 a different thing and it's good to keep us fresh. Yeah. Well, I noticed walking down the hill, it caught my attention from like, I don't know, eight booths away because it, it is that big of a nice. scale. And you had the same conversation yeah. with Dolan and Allie Marie several weeks back where you say that's like a branding. It's like, you know, you know, that was their work. Well, I felt that way with you. Yeah. And I actually stopped looking Ooh. at what was next to me because I was from like that far away was like tunnel vision until I got closer to that piece. So, I mean, that piece nice. really working on in that way, I think is yeah. kind of a cool direction. Thank you. Thank you. I got, I have some, uh, some more ideas uh, in that same kind of series. The The trick now is going to be how to do it lighter. Lighter. Because yeah. <laughs> uh, right now I'm like, I'm, at, I'm beholden to whoever my neighbor is and, or if I've hired somebody to help me move, sure. but it was yeah, it's nine feet and 85 pounds. And there's no way I'm, my wingspan is even Jeez. that. So. Yeah. I didn't even think um, of that <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Definitely. Well, I will admit but, that morning coming to saying, Hey to you and checking out your booth. 
we're having a conversation and then all of a sudden everyone's going to appreciate this. <laughs> My face drops and I'm like, oh, shit. He's shoving breakfast in his mouth and I'm talking to him. <laughs> You ruined my <laughs> breakfast. How dare you talk to me while I eat? I, you know, I mean, nobody's nobody's begrudging you that one. I, it was flattering that you made your way down the hill, but I did, I did have. I to did laugh. hear in my ear as I'm realizing, I'm like, don't talk to artists who are filling their mouth with food. <laughs> I did text Ty after that, really. Like, You'll never guess who just came to talk to me while I was eating. Anyway, oh, okay. Man. Well, we both have big weekends coming up here. I want to first of all. Send out a shout out. It's probably it's already would have happened when this airs. But our good friend okay. Clifton is tying the knot this weekend. Tying the knot this weekend. So huge congratulations to the good friend of the show, Clifton Henri. He and his lovely fiance Cat will be wed by the time this airs. Right. It'll it'll have happened uh, yesterday. So they're getting married on a Sunday, and so huge congratulations and and thank you for the the contributions that he's given to the show. Yeah, good friend and good episode he had last year talking about his work and getting seen by Halle Berry and going viral and Alicia and Keys. finding your voice. Yeah, finding too. your voice. That's a big thing uh, for him too. So that's a, a good reason to dig back into season one, one of our first handful of episodes that that we're both real proud yeah, of. Yeah, definitely. So that's a big thing going on this weekend, and we ourselves have kind of a big trip planned. Renee and I are heading off to New York, not to do mm. a show, but to drop off a piece and to scope out a project that we're in negotiations with with somebody. So this is kind of a new thing to drive cross country to work on a project. Yeah. So it's kind of it's, fancy. I feel a little excited about it. Heck yeah. Go to Manhattan. Big lights, big city. That's great. I That's know. Great. Well, we all wish you uh, big luck on that trip. I hope it is successful. I hope you can close a bigger deal out of it, too. That sounds yeah. great. So that'll be a fun trip, but it is different. We we kind of get our head around hopping in the van and stuffing it full of everything we've got in our studio to go set up a show and to just like kind of get in the van and not have like you're you're cramped yeah. to the, you know filled to the gills and stuff. yeah i'm going away for the weekend and um we actually have a funeral to go to on saturday unfortunately but oh, um no. we're hopping in a car a you know, car? It's like, what the hell is this thing? Yeah. A car? We're going to get in my wife's car. Isn't this for driving around town, not for going anywhere yeah. far? <laughs> she, well, yeah, I mean, she's a jeweler. She could go to a yeah. show in her car right. and run a tent and, and do all that stuff. But we're going to hop in her little Volvo. And man, it's going to be so nice to just sit there as a passenger and, and not worry about setting up. You know, yeah. nobody's going to. It's like do, going to an art show. Like, do you kind of like going to uh, something that's not art show related? I feel like I'm going to get there. They're going to ask me to bury the body. <laughs> I'm like, okay, get to work. Right. <laughs> I was like, let's see, I'm going to a funeral. I need to bring my shovel. I need to bring my tarp so that I don't mess up the grass. Oh. Um, anyway, I'm not, it makes it sound like I bury bodies for a living, but maybe you, know, you do. Maybe you don't. Eh, watch your P's and Q's, Douglas. <laughs> so, <laughs> hey, so one of the conversations we were having at the last show we were talking about, sometimes we, we find as artists that we're, we're making work that might seem kind of like super specific or, or be like a niche for a certain type of person. And it sure. might not necessarily appeal to both members of a partnership. And how do you navigate your way through that? Hmm. You know, I mean, this this may be a, a side note to that, but I always feel like I, I make something and I think it's going to appeal to one person and it always appeals to somebody oh, else. Oh, okay. So it's that's a that's a weird thing for me. I, I feel like I'm trying to to make it for uh maybe a certain group or or a certain room of a house yeah. or home and and it kind of I don't know, it always ends up kind of going somewhere else. How do you deal with that? I, I just remember when we were talking about it and I was like, yeah, I told I totally get what you're saying. And you looked at me and you said, no, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, and, okay, you know what it was, uh, what we were talking about is, is I was telling a very specific story. And uh -huh. in order to like, like with those portrait pieces that I've done, uh -huh. not only do you have to like the portrait and like the work, you have to like the person I painted and yeah. you have to like the saying that I wrote underneath it. Okay. So it's a very, very specific market. And yeah. I was feeling jealous of you at the time. And because you were like, well, that's like glass. And I was like, the fuck it is like glass. You're, you just have shiny. You just have to have like, it's like this thing. And it, it's not saying a, a story or anything that's that's right. like as honed in. 
And I just was feeling a little, uh, I guess, uh, I was being a jerk is what I was being, I guess. <laughs> it was a big shock. Uh, okay, so I get that point. I, I get that. And I, I do feel like there's an aspect of our business, of, of any artist business, where we are we're kind of making something that we that we love that we have a, a deep connection to somebody might see it and go well i would like it if it was a little different and then there's right. part of us that does that shift and say well i'm going to do what really excites me but i it'll still fit within your range of the pie like you talk about yep. what can i still tolerate making that fits into my aesthetic and my and my thing even if it's let's say a different color you know right <laughs> i mean you're you're probably dealing with the fact that you've got like well if it was a little different blue then it could then it would match the couch there is definitely an element of home interior kind of architectural kind of stuff going on are um, you dropping your spiel on me is that do i hear you kicking into the spiel <laughs> The spiel. <laughs> I'm trying to sell you right now, Will. I've got yeah. some glass I want you to... <laughs> Definitely. I like those art words, man. The architectural and... Yeah, good, good, good. Yeah. I am... Like, what are we... We're looking at, like, middle August by the time this thing airs, and I've noticed this impending feeling of dread. Like, for... I don't know how long this thing lasts, Doug, but... Like that two week, like middle of the cheeseburger sweet spot that we have as art show artists, yeah. where everything for the year is set up and mm -hmm. applications aren't open yet for mm -hmm. for the next year. And yeah. it's like, well, I've already gotten into everything that I'm going to get into. There's no gnashing of the teeth. There's no worry. There's no check your email every 15 minutes. The die has been cast. It's yeah. like you just have to show up and be a worker. <laughs> yeah, I'm a worker. I get three shows left. I'm just going to go do them. And yeah. instead, I'm like, oh, man, this is so great. And then all of a sudden this week, I started getting the emails. Our application is open. Oh. And it's like, oh, I heard it. I don't want to like I get the dread of applying. I'm like, oh, I got to get my new my new zaps in. I got to go go format my images. I got to go do this and I got to you know like I got to go look at my thing again and 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 see exactly. I got to go start. I, okay, Armstrong, stop. What? Now you're putting me into a huge <laughs> panic attack for crying out loud. I, I I literally last night thinking about finishing this year and scheduling a surgery and then next year thinking about what I'm going to do next year and when I can get back Florida's on the road is open. What? Florida is open. I know that's what Time I that's what's stressing me. Oh, I can't even deal with it right now. So okay. I hope you get into Winter Park. Okay. Enough of that. That can be tabled for another time. I have that's, I I just have that inner dialogue all the time. It's like, did you apply to the Grove yet? Did you apply to Winter Park? Are you gonna do Florida? Yeah. Are you gonna are you? go to Fort Myers? So are you? Let's are put you this back go? on you. Are you Howard doing Florida Allen's again? There. You want to talk to Howard? <laughs> you want to talk to Howard? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yep. That's making well, you know us what is, Yeah. Yeah. You know who is not panic inducing, Douglas? Who is that? The lovely cat Tesla. <laughs> We've got her on the show. She is so cool and level headed. And I really appreciate her sharing with us this week the struggles that she went through this year in a very vulnerable way. It's just an inspiring story. It is an inspiring story and in the way she kind of handled it with grace. And she is such a lovely human. And it's really nice to see her and her husband back out there. I think of her as kind of a powerhouse in, in our industry. And, and I've always thought of her as this person of kind of like, you know, just like a strong presence and, and big strong paintings and well she's and, the whole package the whole package definitely the business and the i mean art. it's, it's yep. they're big and they're strong but they're feminine but they're also she's got a voice mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and to kind of bring that to the show and share her strength as well as her vulnerability is, is a, a pretty huge gift so thank you to her yeah yep great talk and let's just roll right into it shall we uh this is cat tesla from northport florida this episode of the Independent Artist Podcast is brought to you by Zap, the digital application service where artists and art festivals connect. You know, Doug, I was sitting down and talking with my wife yesterday. She had just come in from her studio and she was complaining. One of the big shows, they decided to do a do-it-yourself, reinvent the wheel application. Hate that. Hate that so much. Yeah, seriously. I mean, it's like typically an application that would take you two minutes on Zap. All of a sudden, it's going to take you an hour and a half to reformat all of your images to their specifications. It just made me think about how easy 
easy applying what Zap is. You just click a few buttons, you've got your 1920s all formatted, and you are good to go. Exactly. So I personally appreciate what Zap is doing, and thanks for not making us reinvent the wheel every single week like we used to have to do. Kat, welcome to the Independent Artist Podcast. It's so great to see you, and I'm glad you could join us. Oh, I'm thrilled to be here, Douglas. We met for the first time in Des Moines this year, Mm -hmm. but I knew of you from your online presence. I mean, you've got a huge online presence. And I'm zooming by your booth on my knee scooter. And I'm like, wait a minute, that's Kat Tesla. I got to make the introduction. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we both had quite a year of health issues. We have. And I do want to get into that. But before we start delving into the most recent speed bumps we've been going through, I kind of want to lay the groundwork and get to know the broader story of you. I kind of feel like When I started looking at your social and looking at your bio and stuff online, you are someone who has a very strong sense of both sides of your brain. It seems like you work very left and right side. Is that true? Uh, Yeah, that's most definitely true. My short story is that when I grew up, I didn't think I could be an artist. You know, like any kid, I loved painting and drawing. Mm -hmm. I sewed, I sculpted. And in high school, when I was getting ready to graduate, uh, I was a super nerd. I also equally loved math and science. Oh, okay. So I was awarded a one-year scholarship to the Kansas City Art Institute that I declined. And I had academic scholarships. (laughs) I know. (laughs) I know. The audience probably just gasped. You were, you're like identified for having excellence in your creative abilities. And you're like, that's not really what, what we, we don't go on to be artists or what? Was that kind of the practical thing? Well, you know, we didn't know anybody who was an artist. And oh. I remember clearly my dad saying, you got the first year covered. Good luck with that. Oh, so the scholarship, but he's like, after that, you know what I mean? You're on your own kind of thing? Yes. Yes. So, you know, him saying that sent me down a 20-year career in science. So I ended up getting a bachelor's degree in biology and a master's degree in human genetics. And I was on faculty at Emory University in Atlanta as a genetic counselor. Genetic counselors see people through the lifespan. I worked in high-risk OB, so I saw people who might be doing uh, IVF and having pre-implantation genetic diagnosis or somebody who was having an amniocentesis or there was an abnormal ultrasound or whatever, I would be the person that they would see. And then when the results were abnormal, I was the person that called them to tell them. So genetic counselors have, you know, really kind of specialized training in both counseling and science. So our job is to translate complex information into layman's terms. So psychology played a big part of it too, because you have to cushion the blow and transition people into like a game plan yeah. when, when they've been maybe given information that's hard to process. That, that's exactly right. So yeah, you have to get them, you know, kind of back <laughs> where they can hear you. <laughs> back from the brink. Yeah, yeah, so they can hear you. Back wow. from the okay. brink. But yeah. I have to say, I owe my art career to art festivals because okay. my friends and I were going to these art festivals. Oh, that was like your weekend entertainment? Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I couldn't believe what I was seeing because okay. I was walking through like the Piedmont Art Festival in Atlanta when it was going right. on. And yeah. the Virginia Highlands Art Festival and the Dogwood Arts Festival. And I, I was like, oh, my God, they're doing really? it. They're doing it. They're making their living as an artist. And it was at that moment that I was like, I can do this. You know, we've had this story before from some other of our guests. Clifton Henri talked about in his photography and graphic design background, when he'd go to art fairs, he'd be like, I could do what these people are doing. I mean, did you feel like your work would fit right in? Or was it just that there was a model out there, a sales model for you that you could do that? It was really the model, which, Mm -hmm. you know, it just, it just hit me like a two by four. It was like, this is now a possibility because I had put it on the shelf, you know? So was it like the hobby? Yes. You know what I mean? That you could express yourself, but it wasn't a lifestyle. It wasn't a way to make a living. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I entered the Virginia Highlands Art Festival in Atlanta in 1997, and I got in the show. 
I won best in my category, and I sold almost everything I brought only because I had no idea what I was doing with regards to pricing, so everything was very cheap. <laughs> well, don't sell yourself short there. I mean, I mean, I understand that, but no matter what the price, if there wasn't something that resonated with the audience, they're not going to spend ten dollars, let alone you know thousand dollars or you know five hundred dollars, whatever you you entered the market with. But I understand what you're saying. Yeah, there. that's a, I mean, but that's such a, a welcoming entry that oh. the response was like off the charts, accepting, and you sell everything and all that good yeah. stuff. Yeah, no, I I couldn't believe it. And then um, I had a gallery call me and invite me to be represented by them. So literally the next week, I went part-time in my genetics job. Wow. That, that <laughs> fast. I mean, that almost seems like an overnight thing. Well, I was so curious. I had mm. to find out more. Okay. So how did that transition from the professional science world into the art world? How did that work? Well, about four years later in 2001, things were going really well. So mm -hmm. I was planning to quit. Okay. At that time, I was having some medical problems. I had to have a hysterectomy in December of 2001. Mm. So I was going to come back to work for a couple weeks in end of January, and then I was going to you know, give my resignation letter. Sure. So a month after my hysterectomy, my husband was diagnosed with colon cancer. I oh. was 38. He was 41. And it was like the rug of fate had yanked out from under us. Well, and that's a time when a lot of us worked in jobs for healthcare because healthcare was just an impossible thing to count on as an independent. Oh, and and that's the so what happened was I stayed at my job for 5 more years because there five. was no affordable care act. So right. every insurance company said, "Look, we're not going to touch you until your husband is five years cancer free. Oh. And it was just, I, I, it was one of the hardest times, I got to tell you. Because you had the enthusiasm just to, to move into that next world, yes. but you were being held back. Yeah. And so one thing you'll learn about me is I'm a nerd. You know, do you remember okay. in high school, the groups, like there were the jocks and the burnouts and the nerds sure. and the... Well, you know, yeah. whatever. <laughs> I was in the nerd group. <laughs> I, I think I was there too. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> so, so I knew I had these five years that I had to wait because we got our medical insurance through my job. Oh, yeah. I started reading marketing books and business books. My husband and I took courses on body language so that we would understand better how to sell we okay. took courses on negotiation. After that five years was up, we were ready. Well, you are approaching the art world from a real business focus. That's an intense planning for this creative field. I mean, I feel like a lot of us artists jump into the fun part of it, the part where we can access our creativity and express our ideas and our feelings and they don't teach in school, or not many schools. I, I didn't have this experience in, in my school, where they teach you to create a marketing or business plan or anything like that. Right. So you were doing right. that on your own without anyone kind of guiding you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I, I had to be successful. I wanted to leave my day job and not look back. So you had a plan, and, and then you were able to execute that plan when the time frame happened? Right. So I left my genetics job. It was in 2006. And my husband also, he was running a renovation company, kind of boutique renovations for very wealthy homeowners, like, you know, creating a wine cellar or, uh, you know, whatever they wanted, a spa room or that kind of thing. Okay. Yeah. You know, during that five years, I was still doing my art just wasn't full time. Okay. And so things just started to, to really get busy and I needed his help. So first he started helping me in the studio with varnishing all the work, photographing mm -hmm. it, wiring it. Then he started helping me with the website. Then I couldn't keep up with QuickBooks so, you know, I taught him how to do QuickBooks. So, you know, so... There were more holes in the dam <laughs> that he was able to fill. <laughs> right, right. And so, you know, we both decided that we'd rather work for ourselves than somebody else. So he folded his company and that was that was kind of it. Then we forged ahead on the road of art festivals. Wow. 
We just talked to Dolan and Allie Marie Guyman a couple episodes ago, and they have that kind of perfect partnership where they've got Dolan as the artist and Allie Marie as the business side. And to have that partnership, it really kind of covers all your bases. It's, it's really cool. And you have that. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, we we definitely do. And I have to say, my husband is very active in selling the work at the shows. He's He's really good with people because he had to, you know, in his previous job, he was doing quotes and working with people with a lot of disposable income. So it was kind of good training for, you know, that dream art collector that we all hope walks into our booth, right? Right, right. It seems like all of those components of our past play such a beautiful place in our present and in our future. You know, it's it fits in so nicely. Yeah, I, I think so. But I think that's true for every artist. You know, you're putting mm-hmm. your whole life experience into your artwork, whether it's glass blowing or painting or photography. Mm-hmm. I think I think the artist is their art. That's such a good point because one of the things that I struggle with, and it kind of brings me to the crux of our conversation today, is that where does that line, I mean, it's different for everybody, of course, but we are artists who connect with what we make to sell it. So then how do we have a line of what's personal and what's public. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) It seems like that line gets pretty blurry sometimes. Yeah, that can be a little tricky, I would say. (laughs) It was hard for our kids. I mean, our kids grew up on the road with us at shows, and we treat a lot of our collectors like family. Mm -hmm. You know, they come in and we hug them and say, how's the kids and how's the this? And the kids then, when we establish appropriate boundaries with I have a story that I've told on the podcast about somebody who wanted my daughter to come walk with them to the car. And we're like, uh, no, that's not going to happen. <laughs> but yeah, our daughter had no, didn't know any difference. It's like, this is like uncle so-and-so or aunt blah, blah, blah. And we can trust them because whatever. It's just a whole weird phenomenon out there. Oh, yeah, most definitely. Yeah, no, we have collectors that we, you know, stay with at shows. Mm-hmm. You know, we have so many collectors that we call friends and happily so. Yeah. Yeah. So you've been in this full-time artist mode then for 20 some years now, mm-hmm. right? Where that that professional genetic science world was, is in the past. Right. And then your most recent kind of speed bump that comes along is this diagnosis that you had. Right. So in February I had an abnormal mammogram. It was a okay. routine mammogram. And I'm doing all the Florida shows. I don't even remember what was in February. It's it's that kind of experience. And then right. um, a few weeks after that, I have a breast biopsy that is right before Vero Beach. Okay. Then my last show is downtown Naples. So we're waiting for the results. And my husband and I are debating, do we even go to that show? And we had to go because we we weren't sleeping. We couldn't really stand to just be in the house. The, the not knowing. Yeah, the not knowing. That's yeah. It's, mm-hmm. it's all you're thinking about. You know, I think just about every family out there, when a woman has an abnormal mammogram, every step along the way, there is that worry of what are they going to find. Is it nothing or is it something? And so you go on to the biopsy part. I mean, that's an even more invasive kind of like, well, we definitely have something that we need to probe and look into. So I'm yeah. sure that that anxiety was quite high. Yeah, it was It was awful. And not to get too gory on this on the air, but... Oh, get gory. Uh, People like uh, gory. <laughs> <laughs> a breast biopsy, I think, is probably like having prostate biopsy. So okay. I had four abnormal areas in one breast, and they took oh. 24 samples over four hours. Oh, my gosh. And I was icing my chest from Uh every moment after that procedure. So we do the downtown Naples show. I don't even really remember it. We drive back to Atlanta. So it's about nine hours. We take Mm -hmm. our luggage out of the van and I get the call that no woman wants to get, which is the radiologist calling me to say, you have breast cancer. I mean... 
I'm sure there's so many emotions going on and so much, but it's got to feel like this weird kind of full circle moment. Like you are now the person getting the news that you were having to talk through and give the news, you know, in your previous life all those years ago. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So how did you manage that when the roles are reversed? Well, of course, at first it was, it was a really a hard day that particular Monday. So I, I just fell apart at first, you know, the next day my husband and I talked and he's like, well, you know, we've done this before and we right. got through it. He got through it. You were there for him. Right. You know, so it's almost like here we are. Yeah. Pr yeah, pretty much. So. Can't run and hide from it. Right. Can't run and hide. It's right. like you can't just, just pretend it's not happening. So that's a, the reality is just probably sinking in pretty deep what you're going to be dealing with. Right. Yeah. I knew what all the possibilities were, but it just so happened that three days later, we were closing on our home in Atlanta to move to Florida. Okay. Oh, so you, so. <laughs> you already are planning a big life change and now you've got this and you've got doctors. So did you do your treatment in Florida or did you stay put? So what we did was I had to have, you know, a breast MRI. I had to see surgical oncologist, nurse oncologist, um, a plastic surgeon if I wanted reconstruction. Mm -hmm. So we managed to get all those visits in before we moved and we negotiated that we could stay in our house in Atlanta to the middle of April in order to get all the appointments in. Okay. And the young couple that bought our house she's pregnant and she's due the first week of May. <laughs> so, so she, she's like, I, I feel for you, but we've got our own stuff going on that's here. Right. That's right. <laughs> so, so we knew it was a big ask because they were like, uh, we got to get in here. You know? Yes, right, right. So we managed to get those initial appointments done. And then we had a surgery date in May. So we moved to Florida and we were just frantically unpacking and we weren't sleeping because it was all about waiting for a double mastectomy. So that is probably the longest month of your life, I would yeah. assume. <laughs> yes, most definitely. So then there was the question of, well, how, how do I handle this? Um, I yeah. have shows. I have yeah. galleries that are talking to me about commissions. I have people yeah. from shows talking to me about commissions. I teach artists online workshops. I coach some individual artists. So then the question was, who do we tell? The first shock is, is really internal. And it's like, how am I going to deal with what's happening to me physically? The bubble starts going outward. It's like, this affects how I make a living. So I'm sure that as those ripples go outward, how do we manage this life we've right. crafted? Because as right. artists, we have to hustle. Oh, absolutely. And so we panicked for a few days. And then mm -hmm. in, in our heads, we weren't going to be able to keep straight who we had told and who we didn't yeah. tell. We, right. It got down to that. So I very nervously made a public announcement on my Instagram and Facebook pages. Yeah. And right before I did that, I emailed all my galleries and art consulting firms I work with and just said, hey, this is what's going on. You know, nothing until September, pretty much. And, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so... Yeah, right. I it's did like this. I'm telling you first before you kind of just read about it online. Right. right <laughs> before right. the breaking news. <laughs> right. Right. Of course. And, you know, we had already talked with all our family and friends and our friends rallied around us in Atlanta. They were they had been so upset we were moving because I had lived in Atlanta for 32 years. Okay. And right. so you're leaving your support system just when you kind of need it. Right. Yes. Such weird timing. Yeah. I mean, it's never yeah. a good time. Yeah. So I decided to make it public. I had no, no idea what the response was going to be. And I had just so much support on social media. I had women artists from just name a country. They were writing to me saying, 
thank you for telling us your story because I'm dealing with some side effects from my surgery. Nobody talks mm-hmm. about this. It affects half the population. So this just isn't your network of people you know. This is now branched out. However, they find you online are connecting to your story. Right, right. And I had so many women also who skipped their mammogram in the pandemic. And that is right. why I could not get my surgery very quickly. Oh. It's because everybody's coming in with breast cancer. The day I had my surgery, I was one of six that my surgeon set was doing. One of so six? Okay. Six people having a double mastectomy on that day. Wow. And, you know, they they can't, you know, their people are just being diagnosed all the time. You know, so if you... You know, the the trick with cancer, the whole gig is you've got to catch it as early as you can because yeah, then it's right. treatable. And and mine, I just needed surgery because it was caught very early. I was super lucky. Mm-hmm. When people wait, that's when you're going to need, you know, chemo, radiation. You know, when you start ignoring your appointments or you skip, you know, so if you time. think if you skip your mammogram of the pandemic, then you have not had anybody check for two years. That's more than enough time for a tumor to grow. For it to get to a stage where it's beyond where you would, anybody would want it to go. Right. Hmm. Wow. So you put yourself out there and you got love back. You got overwhelming support from people you know, people you don't know. And I mean, there had to be this fear of revealing the most vulnerable thing about yourself. And what if there is no reaction? You know what I'm saying? What if yeah. you don't get that <laughs> love? Social media can be, it, it is such a, a big beast that scares people <laughs> to death. <laughs> Social media is a whole nother subject, but yeah. that, that was the only place to put it. You know, like I couldn't add any more artists to my coaching. Yeah. So then everybody was like, okay, we're going to reschedule. Everybody was so good about it, but there were just too many people to contact. And I was in the middle of moving. If somebody, let's say on a social media page writes, how are you? (laughs) And somebody lets on (laughs) something serious. It's like, it can just, it it can be a lot of fires to put out. I went through the same thing. I'm, I'm dealing with some... Nothing like you, nothing life-threatening, but it is a a bone deformity that I have to have surgery with. And so it's been a rough year because I'm just trying to get through. But I experienced that same feeling of like if I just tell a bubble, a select group, and then they feel like, well, he didn't tell me what's going on with him. (laughs) And I forgot. And there's somebody important to me. It, It really messes with your head. So I totally understand that dilemma you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, I think it's, it's tricky because as artists, we're an aging group, Yeah. The, those of us who do art festivals. So I don't know what the median age is. I'm going to guess close to 50 or maybe mid forties. It's not just going to be me, unfortunately. No. And I mean, the statistics for breast cancer among women is is growing, isn't it? I mean, how common is it? It's one in eight is your lifetime risk. But then it, you know, if you have a genetic predisposition, you know, if you carry a mutation in one of the known breast cancer genes, there are actually several, but the most well known are the breast cancer one and two genes, then your risk is like 85%. It is something we need to whatever health stuff, there's just a multitude of them. We're humans. And part of being alive on the planet is dealing with our health. I mm-hmm. mean, so, and choosing to put ourselves out there and being creative, but then also our work comes from us. It's hard to maintain any sense of, it's almost like we have to treat ourselves like celebrities in a way, which is kind of a <laughs> sickening thought. You know what I'm saying? The ego and everything, but we, we kind of have to. I mean, People fall in love with us. They fall in love with our story. They fall in love with our work based on the experiences they have with us. Right. Yeah. No, I think that a lot of the people that come to art festivals, it's like the artists are Greek gods and goddesses, you know? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, how are you doing now? How are you today? 
today I'm, I'm pretty much back to normal. I'm going to physical therapy because one of the things that you learn is that when they take out lymph nodes from underneath your arm, it's a big yeah. cut. <laughs> right. And there are a shit ton of nerves under your arm. And so you can have nerve damage. Um, it can be temporary or permanent. My doctor thinks mine is temporary, but mm -hmm. it's in my painting arm, <laughs> which, oh. uh, since my breast cancer was on the right side and I'm right-handed. So oh. I have a great physical therapist down here in Florida who actually, one of their specialties is women who have had double mastectomies and are having nerve pain. So it's, it's phenomenal. So I'm, you know, kind of learning a lot now mm -hmm. about how to take care of myself and recover fully, but I'm I'm getting really close. So thanks. Oh, good. That's really good news. Okay, so you put yourself out there online to let people know. But then one thing I I see from your social media is you allow the experience of cancer to also influence what you wanted to make, what you wanted to express, not just like telling your story verbally, but in your work, it kind of seems like it had an impact. Right. So I did have, you know, that time before my double mastectomy and, you know, we were unpacking things, but I was also painting because I was only sleeping like maybe four hours a night. I just mm. was reeling, waiting for my surgery and still yeah. getting used to the idea that, oh my God, I have breast cancer. Mm -hmm. So I painted a lot. And one day I had a uh, a pile of small canvases. And I started writing like a drawing medium, FU cancer on each one. Mm. And I started painting them. And so I did an FU cancer series of small uh, works and I sold them and I'm still selling them, but I raised um, $3,000 and donated it to breast cancer research. Mm. And then I had all these people contact me and say, I want an FU cancer painting. So I had to do more of them. Open it back up again. <laughs> it was great. So I'm going to continue the series until the end of the year. And I'm going to make another donation to breast cancer research probably in November. But wow. it was a really great way for me to kind of get my anxiety out by, you know, using painting as therapy. And yeah. then... Uh, selling those paintings for breast cancer awareness and to raise money for research. Wow. So tell me more about that. Did you, was the FU cancer written across the canvas, but then you painted an abstract on top of it? Um, the words are underneath. So I would, I'd write FU cancer and mm -hmm. then I'd, you know, kind of erase it with a big brush stroke mm -hmm. because I wanted it to feel like I was you know, mentally I was channeling that I was done with right. cancer and that I was cancer free. I was really just trying to think ahead and tell mm -hmm. myself, you know, there's going to be a day where I'm not going to feel like this. I'm going to feel back to at least a new normal. There are some spiritual thinkers out there who believe that it isn't necessarily fantasizing about it. It is energetically creating it. Is mm -hmm. that what you were kind of doing too? I mean, were you mentally trying to heal before the doctors could physically go in and take that cancer out of your body? I don't think I was mentally trying to heal, but I'm a big believer in visualization. So yeah. my husband and I plan out our year and we put together something called a desire board. Mm -hmm. And we do this every year. And I teach artists online to do this as well. You know, what do you desire? Yeah. Uh, maybe you want a house in the mountains. Maybe you want your work in a museum. Maybe you want to laugh more. Maybe you're too serious. Yeah. We have our desire boards pinned on our wall where we can see them. So I made a desire board for my breast cancer. You know, what yeah. did I want to happen? Yeah. And I had a particular surgeon that I wanted at Emory, you know, because I knew actually a lot of the oncologists because I helped start the cancer genetics clinic. Yeah. So I got the surgeon I wanted, Okay. probably just a coincidence, but it was on my desire board. You okay. know, I wanted to 
heal in a particular number of months. I wanted to be able to go to Cherry Creek. All right. So I had, you know, a timeline in my mind where I would be okay enough to do certain things. And I had all of that written down. These are super specific. It's not like a general thing. It's like a specific show you want to be be at, a specific doctor and all that stuff. So cool. Yeah, absolutely. So I think there is like you can you can search Dr. Google and find that there is a lot of science around manifestation. There is mm. like a, the science of manifestation is a thing. Yeah. I'm no expert on that, but mm -hmm. I think it's really good to focus on what you want and not spend time on what you're worried about, like the what if, you know, what if that right. happens? What if that happens? Well, those are the things you don't want to happen. Well, that's what I'm dealing with with my situation because I'm waiting on a surgery uh, to do some fusion of bones. And will I, after this surgery, be able to walk like I'm used to? I need to do that because now with the year of struggling, I chose to wait. I'm kind of lucky in the sense that I got to plan how I do this recovery. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have to stop my entire world and put the income and, and the shows on hold. I could say, I'm going to do this on my timeline when I feel comfortable. But it's been a challenge. It's been a physical challenge to, to navigate. But now I'm getting into that kind of that dark thinking because I've been mm. doing this for so long. Right. Of... Is this my new normal? What if it doesn't go the way I want it to? I really appreciate that suggestion. Yeah. So those are things I would throw out the door and start writing down what you want to happen. Mm. And I would be as specific as you can. And I know it sounds a little woo-woo, you know, to talk well, about this stuff. But we're artists. Um, I mean, there is woo-woo <laughs> involved, right? <laughs> Absolutely. You know, and and the thing is, there are a lot of corporate people on the planet who do yeah. this kind of thing. Sure. There are a zillion books on it. I have other things on my desire board for the year, like like I want to have hair like Cher. Okay. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so, so on a... <laughs> it's not going to happen, but you know, like I grew up watching Sonny and Cher and I, I always wanted to have her hair, obviously. I see. It's not at all what I have, but I mean, you can kind of put anything on there, but I, I have to tell you, Douglas, that my husband and I have a number we put on our desire board at the beginning of the year of sure. what we want to achieve that year. A number for like gross sales, income, whatever. Is that what yep. you're talking about? Manifesting your income? Okay. Yeah. A number for gross sales and we always exceed it. We've done that too for years. In fact... If anyone walks into my grinding room as I stare at it while I'm grinding each piece, <laughs> which I hate to do, that's the least favorite part of, of the process for me is the cold working aspect of glass. And I stare at that number and, and, and then the new number goes down below it and down below it. And that's, <laughs> that's my non-intentional way of doing what you're talking about. <laughs> well, you're, but that's the same. That's exactly the same idea. For focusing sure, yeah. on it. It's yeah. the same exact thing. Okay. Wow. So something that I thought was interesting, when you got into the art business, stepping out of your corporate science -y world, there was a lot of planning in the artwork, kind of like how you planned that transition. And you, you know what I'm saying? You, you had a, a plan for yourself. And that's how you, your work was. And you've evolved to a place where you start at a, at a starting point and you allow the work now to evolve into something you hadn't anticipated when you made that first stroke. Right. Yeah. I I started the first few years were very mixed media okay. with handmade paper and pieces of uh, clay that I was making. And then I segued into painting landscapes and seascapes. So now I'm just doing um, non-objective work. And the way that I work is I view myself as having a conversation with the canvas. So, yeah. you know, one stroke is made, then I'm responding to that, or maybe I've tinted the canvas a particular color and I'm responding to that. Right. So I'm not forcing an outcome. It's more exploratory. Nice. It's more, I don't know, it's, it's interesting. It, 
you know, I think painters are just artists in general. We're creative problem solvers. So sure. you have a you have a canvas in front of you, or you have a hunk of glass, or you have yeah. a hunk of clay. You need to do something with it, you know. Yeah. So how are you going to solve the various problems along the way? I can't speak to glass making, but I'm sure you could tell us, like, well, there's this one part where if you don't get that right, then mm -hmm. the next thing doesn't flow and. No, so, uh, it, it, it's very appropriate to how we work. We work in kind of loose abstracts in our glass with how we apply the color. And colors have different expansion rates. So the form gets dictated as the color is stretching in certain areas of the glass. And then it's a reaction to what the vessel is doing. So it never gets out of our control. It's not like, you know, you'll have somebody walk in your booth who don't know the material and maybe as an abstract painter, they'll say this to you too. It's like, you just have no idea how it's going to turn out right. As if we walk into the session without a plan in mind or without a roadmap. But what I'm describing is we have a plan, but then we have to react to what the materials are doing from our experience of well, if this is stretching here, then we're going to we're going to do this over here to get a desired outcome. And it sounds like that's what you're experiencing with with reacting to the canvas and reacting to the strokes that you make. Absolutely. Yeah, yours sounds a little bit more, you know, like you have to have some knowledge of chemistry and how the glass is going to react. It's a little, it's more physical. Yeah, it's definitely more physical. Like a I always say it's like a soccer match. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. But for you, when you did the, the FU Cancer series, I know you had this vision of being cancer free, but still was it delving in that unknown and saying that you were bringing beauty out of something that was underneath of it, which was that sentiment of I'm really angry with what I'm faced with. Yeah, I think the physical creation of that series was me getting out anger and anxiety about the diagnosis. But I was very surprised that I picked all bright colors. Oh. They ended up being really pretty and uplifting is what people told me. Mm. And I don't know if that was the subconscious thinking about, you know, I just want to be well. Right. Wow. So I noticed when I go through your Instagram that... We talked about that you're very open on your social media, but I notice you've really built a following and an audience. It's almost like a daily practice of putting out a post. It's a very personal post. I mean, they're not all about cancer, but they're also about like there might be words involved about what you're feeling that day or a revelation that you have, and then it gives the work even more meaning. Yeah, I I think that it's interesting to talk about our work. I mm. love to hear artists tell me about their work. I want to know more because you're really learning a little bit about them. You're learning a little bit about technique. You're learning about what they're thinking when they create it. I don't know if you want to get into the business of art, but it's always good to have an intention and a goal behind what you're doing on social media Mm -hmm. So I'm not really posting just on a whim. I have a little bit of a plan. I'm, I see. you know, I'm nurturing my current collectors and artists who might want to take one of my workshops or who need help with their art business. Okay. And so I feel like if I can be transparent, that that's helpful in nurturing both of those audiences. It's a genuine kind of authentic way of communicating with people and also, like you said, nurturing that that business model. You'll get work from social media. You might not sell your work on social media. People will start following you and it's because they're interested in your story. Mm -hmm. They're interested in you. You know, when an artist sells their work, the collector is buying of course, the art, but they're buying the artist. Well, it's super hard to do that online on these channels. You know, you put me face to face with somebody 
and we have a wonderful connection. But then to post it on a worldwide network like that, there is a struggle (laughs) with that. But you do it so beautifully. It feels effortless. I know it's not because there is, like you said, there is a methodology, there's a plan, there's a, there's a strategy with how you do things. Thank you. It's it's something I'm passionate about. I oh. want to let people into my world. Art is about connection, right? So yeah. where I have stood in front of a canvas for weeks or months or however long it took me to finish it, then... The potential collector is going to stand right where I was standing, and they're going to be pacing back and forth, looking at the details, examining the work, making a decision, and they're going to be feeling whatever I have put there, but they're going to be walking the same steps, essentially, as I did. Okay, so that is... An extension of meeting them in the booth or seeing it at a gallery. Right. That this is their way to to touch into the creation and the inception of the birth of the piece. Right. So just like if you have a person walk into your booth, they're not mm-hmm. going to look at the glass from a distance. They're mm-hmm. going to get up close. They're going to want to maybe touch it. They're going to look at it from different angles. Mm-hmm. And it's going to kind of mirror how you created it. You... Mm-hmm. Of course, we're touching the glass and looking at it from different angles. Mm -hmm. I find that art collectors and artists actually have a very intimate connection. Mm -hmm. When somebody buys your work, it's because they both like the work, but there's something about you in the work that they're connecting to. Right. Uh, This mentoring and this teaching that you're currently doing, is that something that you've been doing for a while or did this come about with the pandemic? It stemmed out of the pandemic. In 2019, I had taught workshops in Santa Fe with a friend of mine named Julie Schumer. Mm -hmm. We taught painting workshops, and we had an idea for teaching both painting workshops and the business of art workshops in 2020. We had them actually scheduled and loaded with artists. Our bank account was full. (laughs) And then we had to cancel all that and refund everybody's money. And we were really devastated like everybody was when the coronavirus pandemic began. So Julie called me up one day, maybe a month later, and she said, we're taking this operation online. Mm -hmm. We formed a company and we began filming. Mm -hmm. So we each teach our own painting workshops on our own. We teach one together, but we started teaching a course called the Business of Art online. I see. And can artists take your classes by going to your website? Is that something that's uh, available that way? Is that how they get in touch with you for that? Yeah. So the, um, the business course is actually on the website that Julie and I, our business created. It's called artsmartworkshops.net. Gotcha. Okay. And then what happened was the people who took the business of art course wanted more help. So we Mm -hmm. started a business of art membership and you have access to a library of information. We add new content every Tuesday. We have a, a monthly business call on Zoom that we do with any artist in the membership who wants to be at it. And we help each other troubleshoot issues that they're having in their art business. Cat, you've got like the whole package. (laughs) I don't, I never feel like that. I just feel like I'm trying like everybody else. You know, you know, one of the things that I have to say, it's really wonderful to help other artists. It's just so gratifying. I mean, it's, it's a kick to, to help somebody else. It's, I don't know. It's, it's hard to describe that feeling. Well, that mentoring, I mean, that's really awesome. I mean, that is a, a, a great way to to put all of the things that you've learned and all of your skills into what you know about this business and transfer that on to other people so other people have the access to what you've learned. I mean, that's awesome. That's really cool. So in your teachings, what are some of the, the high points that are most important to you or that you like to to talk to your students about? Well, one thing is that the business of art, I think, is a numbers game. So 
To get to a particular amount of money in a year, you have to do a certain number of shows. You have to sell a certain number of works of art. And Mm. there's a principle called the Pareto principle, which is the 80-20 rule. And in a nutshell, the 80-20 rule states that 80% of your consequences come from 20% of your causes. So for example, 80% of your art sales come from 20% of your customers. And that's a really important thing to understand because people are always trying to get new collectors, but the success rate of selling to a collector you already have is 60 to 70%. That's been documented in a gajillion business studies. This takes me back to the conversation that I had last year with Eric Lee, who has a very specific style. He does back painted glass. Mm -hmm. I know, Eric. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he started with wall pieces, but then he started evolving his style, his look into functional pieces like furniture. And he was saying that those collectors would acquire multiple pieces because they liked him and his aesthetic and his look. And so if he just stayed with wall art, he was going to max out his his customers. Is that kind of what you're talking about? Yeah, most definitely. I mean, you have to evolve so that you continue to have new offerings for your audience. But to try to sell to a new customer, your success rate is maybe five to 20%. It's harder, Mm. but you've already got past collectors of your work. If you nurture that audience, and by nurture, I mean, send them some e-blasts, talk about Mm. your work, They want to know. They want to know Mm -hmm. about you. I've had people opening my e-blasts for over 20 years. And they'll email me and say, I love getting these. And it's because an artist's life is interesting, right? It's like what we said before. Like when you go to an art festival, the audience thinks that we're like Greek goddesses and Greek gods. Right. It's uncomfortable for us to have that ego, but that is... Maybe what the collectors expect from us or want from us. Right. So it's it's going to be way easier to sell a second time or a third time or a tenth time to somebody who's already qualified. They've already bought from you. You already gotcha. know they like your stuff. So mm-hmm. I find that a lot of artists don't collect emails. Email marketing, I think, is one of the if not the most important part of your business is collecting Mm. emails and, you know, cause like my social media accounts, yeah, I have a lot of followers and this and that, but I don't own that. Facebook or meta owns that. Right. And they drop in, the the audience drops in and finds you. And then all you can control is what you put out. You can't control what actually shows up in their feed. They control that. Right. The right. emails, we can control what they see. Right. And I can have those in a spreadsheet on my computer. So I've got them. It's not like another mm. company has them and is holding them hostage. Interesting. Cool. Are there any other techniques or things you that are important to you when you for your teaching? I know the word sales or selling is super taboo to most people. They cringe, mm-hmm. you know, but selling is educating. That's all it is. Mm. So mm. if you can educate somebody about what you do, you're selling. So think about it this way. You go to buy a car at a car dealership. What does the salesperson tell you? They tell you about the car, <laughs> you know, yeah. they tell you. <laughs> they tell you about the radio knobs and the <laughs> right. whatever. Right? <laughs> right. The tires and the, is it fabric? Is it leather? But I understand that discomfort because we have to tell them what we were feeling and what we were thinking when we made this piece. And it's more comfortable for us just just to say, here's the painting, look at it. <laughs> What do you get from it? But I know that's harder to sell it if you don't if you right. don't talk about what's going on in it and their themes or whatever. Yeah, I I think that everybody wants to know your story. Your story sells yeah. your work. They're looking at you and your art, and they kind of want to know how did this all happen? How are you here? How did how did yeah. this work evolve? And so if you're just able to talk about your work and educate your audience. That's it. That's what selling is. 
Are there any points during the year where cancer actually served as a distraction to selling the work? Hmm. I don't really bring it up unless somebody else brings it up. So I had a really nice past collector came to Des Moines and she Mm -hmm. brought me this diamond. It's a pin that you like wear on your lapel. It's um, a heart with the breast cancer pink ribbon through it. Yeah. And she just came to give it to me. And she said, somebody gave this to me when I had breast cancer. And so I want you to wear it and I want you to keep it. And then there'll come a time where you're going to be able to give that to somebody else. And so, you know, it was just this incredible gift from her. And it really is like a really nice piece of jewelry. (laughs) Okay, right. It was a piece of jewelry. Yeah, it was an actual piece of jewelry. What would you say, looking back over this year, this this speed bump of cancer, what do you think you've kind of learned through that experience? Mm, So many things. So I would say one thing is that most all people are really, really nice, Mm. even when you think they're not. (laughs) Yeah. I heard from people that I was not expecting to hear from. Mm. People really care and they're very, very kind and generous. So I think the generosity of people just blew me away. I've really learned a lot from the talks from Brene Brown, where she talks about connection and how we form connections with people. And I have learned in the past few years that where we have true connection is being able to safely share vulnerabilities and have somebody meet you on that level and share their vulnerabilities with you as well. And there it's a safe place of growth. And so that's such a sweet and powerful thing for you to be at your your low. I mean, that's, mm-hmm. that's like the bottom to have your mortality be on the table and to have people come to you and support that and honor it. Yeah, it, it was really just mind blowing. And I think that's really the biggest lesson that at the end of the day, most people are really good. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, the other thing was I... I just can't even tell you how many emails I got from collectors. So the other thing that happened was everybody shared their story. So I know all the people on the planet now who have had cancer (laughs) because because they all tell you. (laughs) Well, there's definitely an element of woundology where where we bond over our shared wounds, right? (laughs) Right, right, right. But, But I think also is that I guess the thing that I've learned is when something bad happens, you can always find just a kernel that carries you through. What kept you going? Was it the reaction from people around you that kept you getting up and staying positive? Or is that just your nature? What what, what kept you going? <laughs> um, probably a little bit of both. I'm definitely a glass half full kind of person. Sure. But this kind of thing brings you to your knees. So I would really say it, it was other people supporting me. I was getting cards and letters. I, I had calls from show directors. I have cards mm. from show directors. One show director sent me flowers. I mean, just stuff that oh my gosh. you would never expect. And I didn't even yeah. know they knew, mm-hmm. you, you know, so I didn't even know who saw my posts on social media. Where it came from, right. how the knowledge came to them. Right. And so I think that the rallying of the art community really kept me going. And so many women were like, look, this is what happened to me and I'm still here. Okay. And so that, that kept you from getting too dark. That's right. Knowing that there's a positive, that they had a positive outcome. There's no reason I can't have that same positive outcome. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I think that's what happens. You get to a particular point in your life. Like I I never dreamed I would get breast cancer, but I never dreamed I'd be talking about it ever. You know, like, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and like when you first get cancer and they tell you, you can't even say it. Like I was trembling, you know, talking to my mom to tell her and she was you know, freaking out. She had to get off the phone because she was losing it. You know, she's 87. She hasn't had any health problems in her life. She's going to live forever. But Mm. she was just devastated that her daughter 
you know, had this. And it's the fear that it's the thing people don't want to talk about. It's the it's the worst case scenario. It's like, oh my god, now it's it like my sister in law was diagnosed a couple of years ago. You told and me leading that. up to that, my mother in law would tell anyone who would listen, we don't get cancer in our family. And it's almost oh, really? like, really? Well, now, you know, it's almost like don't tempt fate because <laughs> right, right. <laughs> then it touches your family. And, oh. and it's the thing that my wife and my sister-in-law were like, you know, this is something we think is not going to happen. Yeah. And it's not anybody's fault. Right, right, right. I've also found with what I'm dealing with, my wife and I have... We have an amazing partnership, and I know you and your husband have an amazing partnership too, and it's in these moments where we really have to lean on our spouse, and it's not easy for me because I'm a real, like, I'm like a take charge. I get a lot of my self-worth from my ability to be doing things. I mean, doing things, like actually physically accomplishing (laughs) stuff, and that kind of really messes with your head when you have to adjust what you're capable of doing. Oh yeah, for sure. I'm I'm kind of like the ever ready bunny. I I go, mm. you know, I'm a hard worker. I like work. I know another nerdy thing about me, but um <laughs> I like running a business. So it was really hard to be in pain curled up in a ball for weeks on end. My husband of course was a rock. He was fantastic and Like I said, you know, we knew what the experience was going to be like a little bit because of his cancer, but um, I can tell you it's really, really different when it's you. Right. I'm sure that when you were his support in those moments, it's like we will bend over backwards for somebody else, but it is hard to be the one to say, okay, for my case... (laughs) Will you bend down and take off my shoes and ankle braces? It's just like, I feel I feel awful. Like, who would want to do that? But that's the blessing in that relationship and that partnership. That person truly has your back. And so I hope you could take that strength and that support and not feel bad about it, you know, to allow yourself to be taken care of. I didn't really have a choice. You know, my, my husband had to help me shower. He had to wash my hair because you can't lift your arms after a double mastectomy for almost a month. It's impossible. The pain is excruciating if you try. I, I tried by mistake and, uh, you know, you only make that mistake one time. So, and then after he washed my hair, I was like, um, you're going to have to brush it. (laughs) So, (laughs) <laughs> I guess no no dude with short hair really understands what's involved with <laughs> with combing through, right? Right. I'm like, I need a comb or a brush through this wad of... You're like, so... see why I want Cher's hair? Come on. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, man. oh, my gosh. This has been so much fun. And I really appreciate you being vulnerable and sharing your story. And and maybe just one last thing I'll ask you is, is if you going through this had any kind of like words of advice or words of wisdom to somebody who's in your position, what would you say to them? I would say ask for help. You know, Mm -hmm. I don't know why, but like my mom's generation, Mm -hmm. she was shocked that I was telling people that I put it on social media because in her generation, they didn't talk about that kind of thing. And I couldn't imagine going through this in some isolation bubble. So I would say, ask for help. Don't need to bite any bullets and get through it. Right. right? It's not, it's not time to be strong, man. It's, you know, it's time to just be real. That's so great. That's beautiful. Kat, I can't wait to see you in person and give you a big (laughs) fat hug. Thanks for this talk. Thanks, Douglas. All right. Have a good one. Great talk, Douglas. Great talk with Kat. Kat, thank you again for sharing your voice and, and um, everything you've got uh, to give here to our little industry. So, oh, she, and she was pretty powerful words. She's such a support to me, too. I mean, a lot of the stuff that she went through with cancer, my situation isn't life threatening, of course, but 
She had so many comforting, inspiring words that are getting my head on straight with what I have to deal with. Well, they're inspiring words for all of us, especially dealing with like, I mean, we're all God, I still feel like I'm one of the younger people on the circuit. Yeah. I'm like, I'm in my, you know, we're both the same age. Mm -hmm. We're 51, mm -hmm. um, 52 here at the end of next month. Right. But uh, we are all going to be facing these little health hiccups. And hopefully there are things that we can get to the other side of. And if I could just get that cadmium brush out of my mouth while I'm working and, <laughs> uh, you know, just the dangers that we all face, but we're all going to be uh, dealing with little, little health things, uh, here on out. Right. Yeah. And her advice on how for me to not get into that dark thinking, I know you and I yeah. talked about this last year when you were experiencing your Achilles tear, it's hard not to get dark. It's hard not to feel like this is how it is for me now. This is this is my new normal. And right. and then doing shows and having like the last show I did, it it really wiped the floor with me. I mean, I could not function after the weekend and I had to to put in a cancellation for my next show. I really wanted to go do the show. I needed to do the next show, but I had to cancel. Yeah, that's a huge bummer, but I mean, we the only thing we can do is to kind of face it with Whatever kind of grace we have. I, I don't have any, to be honest. Um, next time I go down, I've already promised my wife I'm, I'm going into therapy. Okay, yeah. Uh, no shame in the in the mental health game. I'll definitely go talk to somebody. I, I just, I can't handle it myself. And I realized that last time I went down. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, for sure. In regards to canceling my last show, I do want to send out a thank you to the show for being like so gracious and offering me you know, my booth refund. And, you know, I really believe that if a show can, if they can fill your spot and they can give you a hardship refund, if you're in crisis with your health or a death in the family or something like that, that it should COVID. become an industry standard that, that they take care of us like that. You know, another thing, it's, it's like this double-edged sword. I know a lot of art show folks out there are, are like, well, why should I tell them I'm canceling when they're not going to give me my money back. Mm. And that's kind of a dick move, yeah. uh, honestly, because somebody's sitting there at home going, oh, my God, I've got the mortgage coming up and I've got this and I don't have enough yeah. here and I could really use a, use a show or it's always the right thing to do to cancel when you know you're going to cancel. But I, I know that the incentive sometimes is not there if people aren't going to pay them back. Yeah. Yeah. I can understand that side of it. It's hard. But I think to the greater community, to all of us out yeah. there, we're all in this together and we can all say that we we know what it's like to be on that that last couple of dollars and we're like, where's the next windfall coming from? And that show yeah. can turn things around. So it's really important to, to think of that, put ourselves in that, you know, situation. And it's all been said before. We are, you know, art carnies. Art we are car truck drivers. We are gamblers. Right. You know? I mean, we, are... we have that faith. We put that faith out there that that things are going to come through for us, even when things are looking a little bit bleak, either that or it's like, we're like gamblers where we, we think our lottery ticket is going to come in or something like that. I, absolutely. You get that acceptance. You know, you're, I'm only one more acceptance away from a successful year. I just got to get that show, man. I got to get that show. And after all of those yucks, Douglas, I do feel like we need to end on kind of a somber note. Before we sign off for today's episode, I just wanted to pay a quick tribute to a dear friend who we lost yesterday, Vicky Munn. She's a roadshow artist. She's been out there with, with Lance for many, many years out there. She's a huge member of the tribe, Douglas. And uh, it's it, these kind of losses um, we can't take easily. And they're kind of huge blows to our entire community. You knew her a lot better than I yeah. did. And my heart's out to you and, and all of her friends, all of yeah. us. So special. She's definitely the boss of of that operation. I, I think back to your conversation, we've talked about it a couple times this episode about Dolan and Allie Marie. She was the business part of the Lance Munn 
furniture company, and she was a driving force. And Lance used to sing the praises of what an amazing business person she was for their their business. Yeah. And so we're all gathering around their booth uh, Saturday night, five o'clock, and it was like a rain out weekend. This was the Bayou City where I think 10 people came through the gate the entire weekend. Mm. I think they shut the show down early on Sunday. Anyway, we're standing around at the end of the day, long, wet day, having a glass of wine. And Lance turns to me and he says, you know how good of a business person Vicky is over here? You see these wine chests that I make? I make those so that this wine that we're drinking right here can be considered a, a tax deduction. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> That's beautiful. Okay, I just have just one more story to tell about the first time Renee and I met Lance and Vicky at a show. Yeah, bring it. This was years and years ago. We were traveling to shows with little kids. And I don't know if any other art show artist feels this way, but I feel sometimes like when we would show up to a show in those early days, it was like we were a disaster. Definitely. Yeah. You open up the back door to the van and even now it happens, you know, all your shit falls out onto the ground and <laughs> you open up the side door to the van and your your spazzy seven and 10 year old come running out like- <laughs> Similac and dirty diapers. <laughs> that's right. Kept in a cage for two days to get to our show. <laughs> All this happened right in front of Lance and Vicky's booth that year. And I was just like, these people are probably thinking, what is going on? Sure. But they met us with such kindness and warmth. They welcomed us. They told us all about their years on the road, raising their kids, how their son was the gopher. He would go down the line and booth sit for people up and down the way so they could run to the van and, and take a lunch break. I just feel like it just set the stage. It just left us with a lifetime of great experiences with them out here on the road. Yeah, I'm really sorry for your loss. And, and really, again, like I said before, for all of our losses, whether you knew her or knew of her, I had just met her. Uh, she was kind of a, a shining light on our industry. So yeah. thanks again for those good words. So to all our friends out there who are close to Vicki, to her family, Lance, I, I feel for you, man, and their children, Brian and Kelly, and their beautiful granddaughter, Piper. I just, I offer you our deepest condolences. She really left her mark out here on the road and she will not be forgotten. Yeah, there really is no way she could be forgotten. It's it's a huge mark and, and um, a huge void that she's she's left behind. So we're all going to have to tighten up, be a little kinder to each other out there, folks. And uh, we'll see you next time. All right. Take care, everyone. This podcast is brought to you by the National Association of Independent Artists. The website is naiaartists.org. Also sponsored by Zapplication. That's zapplication.org. And while you're at it, check out Will's website at willarmstrongart.com and my website at sigwithglass.com. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast to be notified when we release new episodes. 